Arlene Zuck is our guest today from uh, University of Minnesota, uh, previously at Riverside until the last four years. We have our little agreement, which is that I'm not going to tell too many stories about her, and she's not going to tell too many stories about me, because I first knew her when she was a graduate student at the University of Michigan in the 1980s. She was a part of this amazingly creative group. Um, and I also found out today, looking at her CV, that her first paper was the big paper in science with Will Hamilton about parasites and bird coloration. She's taken on from that to become the world's expert on crickets and in particular their behavior and particularly sex and disease in crickets, which she will talk about, I hope, today. You want to mention it a little bit? Not a cricket um, talk. We'll have to have her back for another time uh, for another talk. Also looking through her CV, it's really fun to see which awards she's gotten. And if you, it's really nice to get the Ed Wilson Award, the Linnaeus Lectureship, the Hamilton Lectureship, and the Tinbergen Lectureship from all these different major societies. She's also served as president for the um, International Society for Behavioral Ecology. And also at Minnesota, in, in addition to all of her graduate students, research and the like, she's also the dean of the faculty and has been very invested in both helping develop faculty and find ways to strategize to prevent sexual harassment and discrimination. Right now, today, though, her topic is Models on the Runway, and it's up to you, Marlene. Thanks, um, and hopefully you can all hear me, but I, great. Uh, that does mean that I'm going to have to stand behind here for the microphone, because otherwise I'd have to be wearing two, so I, I do apologize for that. So, and thanks so much for inviting me. This has been a really fun visit. I'm discovering that almost everybody I know and admire is, seems to be at ASU, um, which was not something I had realized before. Um, and I want to talk, so not about crickets. If anybody wants to talk about crickets, I'm totally happy to talk to you for as long as you like about crickets um, uh, later on. But I, I decided I wanted to do a slightly more um, kind of general talk about something that I've been thinking a lot about recently um, that has to do with a topic that I, I hope is familiar to everybody because we all use models. And we use them either in a literal sense, like this little tiny adorable car um, that was uh, built as a model of a real car. And we use them as replicas. We use them as ways to imitate what's out there in the real world. We also use models as a way to think more abstractly about processes. So we have theoretical models. And there are people who are theoretical biologists who, who do exclusively theoretical work. We also have models as a way not of replicating something that's out in the world, but instead as their own internally consistent reality. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And then finally, we have what you could really think of as models of convenience, ways that we have a system we work in that's representative of other systems, we just happen to all agree to use one thing. And that's what we mean when we talk about model organisms or model systems. And so I think the idea of a model system and the idea of a model in terms of theory are really quite closely related. And so I started thinking about this in part because of a, a paper that I read in a philosophy of biology group that I attend that I'll, I'll talk about more in a second. But one of the first questions that comes up when people start talking about using models in biology is, well, how real are they? How realistic are they? How much do they actually show you about the way the world works? And I started then thinking about the other way in which we use the word model, the sort of more colloquial way, which is like people wearing clothes that are designed by um, designers in a particular place. And so then everybody goes to watch them during Fashion Week or what have you. And there's very famous models, which are actual human beings, who go up there and show you the clothes. But you know, even though we don't tend to think of those things as being similar, I think they really are. And John Seeger and Fred Adler wrote a paper, in, um, actually an entry for the Encyclopedia of Evolution a number of years ago, where they said, OK, any formal device that facilitates what if reasoning can be called a model. And because of that, if all you have to do is facilitate what if reasoning, you don't have to represent reality, not, not explicitly. You're not supposed to be a replica of the world. And the same thing is true for fashion models. Really, people who design clothes are not expecting all of us 
to wear clothes that look exactly like the ones on the runway. And they don't really expect us to all have models or to all look like fashion models, even though, you know, obviously there's a lot of discussion about how important that's been in media and, you know, body image and so forth. But, but really, they're just a device that facilitates what if reasoning, whether that has to do with biology or in this case, whether it has to do with what people might look like if they dressed a certain way. And so models in evolutionary biology are, according again to, to John and Fred, not hypotheses to be tested for acceptance as a description of reality. So you don't say, oh, how real is this? Does this, does Kate Moss look like a real human being? We know the answer to that, it is no. But in that sense, biological models are just like, and evolutionary models are just like using other kinds of models. All right, well, why is that important or interesting other than just being a way to think about yourself and Kate Moss in the same sentence, which is, you know, which is worth something certainly, but not really what, what I was, um, uh, aiming for here. So once you have a model, the question is, what good is it? I mean, if you're told that this is representative, that you're using it to facilitate what if thinking, then you have to ask yourself, well, what's, what's the domain where they're applicable? How do we use these? And again, you know, you look at people who are dressed like this, you really don't expect that, you know, people in the audience, like no one in the audience looks like any of these people, right? Um, which, you know, is not just because we're biologists, although that's part of it, because um, we really don't dress like this, but, but, you know, no one expects that and it's because they're not, they're not real people, they're models. They're models in the same sense that we talk about models in biology. And so then I started thinking about what we're trying to do in terms of constructing a world unto itself versus replicating one that's out there. And I started doing this in the context of um, a paper that I read um, as part of a philosophy of biology group that I'm in along with uh, a number of both philosophers at the um, through the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science and a lot of biologists who attend this, um, most especially Mike Travisano, who's a microbial evolution person who um, also goes to the Philosophy of Biology group. We read um, this paper, so I want to talk about different types of models and the way they're used, and we read this paper that just came out last year um, that talks about the mind, the lab, and the field, and the way that scientists divide what we do in these three realms and then talk about whether those three realms are really as distinct as we might like to believe, and, and then take it, I hope, more to evolutionary medicine by talking about what model organisms are most appropriate for us in health. I'm gonna talk about evolution, um, and I'm also gonna get to Jerry Seinfeld, but that's not till the very end, so. Okay, so as all of us are familiar, with, biologists often divide the world into three parts or three ways that we study. We have theoretical studies where we might use mathematical models to try and understand certain phenomena. We have laboratory models where we're looking at something under very controlled conditions. Or we have field models, and to that I've added the idea that we have clinical practice. We have the way we actually use the information that we've gathered from these other sources. And so you can think of the field as being similar to the clinic um, in the sense of, of uh, the practice of medicine. But when we think about using theory, and we think about going from a verbal explanation to a more formal theory or a mathematical model, it's important to understand what the real utility of those mathematical models might be. And a paper from a working group at Nescent a few years ago, uh, that emerged from a working group a few years ago by uh, Mar uh, Maria Cervetio is the uh, lead author, um, talked about the utility of mathematical models specifically for evolutionary biology in a context that I think is really interesting. So, okay, verbal models, so you just, verbal models which is kind of a fancy way of saying an explanation. They're meant to explain why we see certain biological phenomena and we come up with verbal models all the time. But mathematical models can act in a somewhat different way. So it's not that they're a substitute for the verbal model, it's that they can act as what are called proof of concept tests 
of whether the logic in that verbal explanation is internally consistent. And so the idea is that mathematical models need to be simple because they only have the essential features that we're trying to test. And they're, we have control over them because all we're testing is the logic. We're not actually looking at the biology of whatever system we're interested in. So, so this is a rough schematic from, that's from their paper um, of how, you know, basically how science works. Mike and I kind of flip the, um, the letters here beca because I think it kind of makes more sense thinking about this. But in all cases, what we're doing, whether we're practicing more conventionally the scientific method or whether we're using modeling or empirical approaches, we're always starting with an observation of nature from which we build hypotheses. We then, for all of these, we gather evidence, we pick assumptions and build a model, we design some protocol to gather our data for, I mean this is going to be more relevant for the empirical part and the building model is obviously going to be important for the proof of concept, but in both cases there are ways in which we're trying to gather evidence. Then we analyze those, that evidence, whether that's by analyzing the model itself or by analyzing the data. And then we evaluate the hypothesis we created and propose new directions to go. So that's a, it's an iterative process, but in each case, these are self-contained. And in part, this, um, uh, this diagram came about because I know that Maria got really frustrated with, say, submitting a grant proposal that contained theoretical work in it and having someone say, well, but this is incomplete because are you going to then go out and test your model? That's not what these models are for. They're proof of concept models and what you're trying to do is see whether the logic is internally consistent. And the way I think a lot of people have viewed how we use models is to say, okay, well, you come up with some theory and then you really want to know what's going on in the real world, whether that's the field or, like I said, clinical practice. And so what we're going to do is start out with this really simple and controlled way of understanding things and then move into something that's very complex and very unconstrained in the real world. And what we might do kind of on the path to that is work in the lab where we've got some of the costs, um, or we've got fewer of the costs of each of these, but at least some of the benefits of both of them as well. And so I think there's been this tendency to view it as kind of a one-dimensional path that people go along, where you start with theory, you move into the lab, and then you're going to end up understanding reality. Um, and so this is just another illustration of how that works. So we've got a simple um, or controlled environment um, and, uh, where we can have um, a lot of replicates. We've got, um, uh, say, uh, a bunch of uh, microbes that are assembled in the lab. And we've got all these highly tractable um, systems where you can do experiments where you know that all of the environmental conditions are the same. At the other extreme, oh, right. Um, and so uh, when, when you do that, of course, people immediately say, well, this is fine for being in the lab, but it's really artificial. And you can't really generalize because is something that's true for microbes in a vat, in you know, an incubator, or in um, uh, carefully controlled conditions actually going to apply to what's going to you know, happen again in the real world? At the same time, let's say you do the most complex um, study of all and you want to understand the ocean. Well, you can't replicate that, um, or I suppose you could by replicating multiple oceans, but you know, if you really want to understand what's going on in, say, the Atlantic Ocean, then you can't replicate it because there's only one Atlantic Ocean. And so you could do a whole ecosystem experiment. It's very natural and it's very realistic, but here, you can't replicate it. You often have to study it for a long time. And you can't really manipulate it very well because you have to do something that's mechanistically simple because otherwise you couldn't do it in the whole ocean. So, where, so, so instead, one possibility is rather than trying to just move along this single dimension, what we can do 
is use so-called proof of concept modeling, but use organisms to do it. And so in this case, what we've got, sometimes people talk about this in terms of what, what are called microcosm experiments, where you're kind of um, looking, you're not replicating the world, you're creating something that's new. And these are, it's best done with microbes, um, or at least a lot of the best work I think has been done with microbes, where, for example, a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Rich Lensky's long-term evolution experiment, um, and you can take E. coli, and you can understand, for instance, how phylogenetic history can affect subsequent evolution. This is not an experiment on E. coli qua E. coli. It's an experiment creating a world using E. coli to understand a more general concept. Um, you, it's just another couple of examples. Um, you can understand adaptive radiation by putting microbes in different spatially structured environments. Um, and uh, this is some of Mike, uh, Mike Travisano's work, um, uh, that you can use yeast and understand how you can go from a single-celled organism to a multicellular organism and understand the evolution of multicellularity itself. So in, in all of these cases, we're not talking about a model in the sense of a replica. We're talking about a very highly artificial, constructed new world that's designed to test ideas. Well, OK, but, but this isn't math. This is an actual organism. I mean, you know, they're just, I mean, OK, they're little micro, but they're still, they're real organisms. So, what does that mean about the line between doing so-called empirical work and doing so-called theoretical work? And, I, and so this is a, a, a quote from uh, the uh, uh, Servetio et al.'s paper. The predictions of these proof of concept models can be evaluated empirically. And the photo up here, uh, which is a very old one, is um, those of you who um, took ecology uh, uh, several decades ago, will recognize this. This was, this was Huffaker's um, uh, constructed world with uh, the oranges and the Vaseline and the, um, uh, 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 and the insects that were you know, moving from these. Oh, good, someone is nodding in the audience. Does anybody else remember Huffaker? Yeah, a couple of people do. Oh, oh good, yes, there's people who remember Huffaker. So again, this was a similar sort of thing. It's like you're not trying to understand how oranges and um, you know, uh, arthropods interact in the real world. You're constructing something. And so the tests are not tests of a model. So you don't use the E. coli to test a model. The model is correct because you know, its predictions follow from the assumptions. But what they are is tests of the way that the model itself, internally consistent though it is, may be relevant to real empirical systems. And so in that sense, they're a way of testing whether the assumptions of the model are met in nature. So they're an indirect test of the assumptions. But this is really different than saying, oh, you came up with something in theory, but does it work in the real world? So those are not the same thing. What that then means is that, in fact, there's a continuum between doing theoretical and empirical work, and it's not so easy to come up with this divide. All right, and that brings us to, so this is actually where I started thinking about uh, putting this talk together, um, was we read this paper. Um, uh, in, like I said, this uh, philosophy of biology group that I'm in, called The Mind, the Lab, and the Field, Three Kinds of Populations in Scientific Practice. And so the authors are um, philosophers and a uh, statistician um, uh, at uh, Santa Cruz and Berkeley. And um, they talk about the use of models in a way that was sort of unfamiliar to me as a practicing scientist, but I found, I, I found it really interesting. And so I don't know how many of you have, um, I, I don't know how many people are interested in philosophy of biology, but um, there's always this discussion of you know, how much no understanding philosophy of science really helps us as scientists. And there's that old saying of, um, uh, what is it, that uh, scientists need philosophers of scientists the way um, birds need ornithology, um, at, which you know, is an interesting way to think about. I'm not sure I agree with that, but it's an interesting um, sort of statement. But, but I, we'll, we'll, we'll go with this as a philosophy of science um, uh, perspective. So what they say in the paper is that um, scientists use models to understand the natural world, and it's important not to conflate model and nature. And they say that there are three different kinds of populations, in, and they were talking about ecology and evolution in particular, um, theoretical, laboratory, and natural populations. 
Um, we discuss ways to move safely, I think that's such an amazing word, safely, um, between three distinct population types while avoiding confusing models and reality. And so, you know, like I said, this paper just came out and this is a topic that is of, of current interest both to philosophers of biology and to a lot of people in um, uh, ecology and evolution. But I started thinking, and, uh, with, um, and uh, with Mike, started thinking about the way in which what they just said is, is certainly mirrored in this very traditional way of looking at things where you go from theory to the lab to the field. But what if, in fact, from using what we learned about this proof of concept modeling, we could make this into two dimensions? And so instead, we've got the same characteristics. So we've got being unconstrained versus being controlled. And we've got simple systems versus complex systems. But actually, when we study nature, we can fill in any one of these quadrants. And so, for example, both you know, the Huffaker's oranges and the multicellularity and Lenski's experiments are on the kind of simple controlled end. But you could certainly fill in something that would be simple and yet unconstrained. You could have something that would be controlled and complex and so forth. And I think understanding where those edges overlap is actually very useful. Um, and to that end, I want to re-examine briefly some of the, the stuff from their paper. So they say, OK, we've got these three things. We've got the mind, the lab, and the field. We've got theoretical, laboratory, and natural populations. And so in their paper, they look at one example of each of those three things. Um, they look at uh, R.A. Fisher's um, classic study, and they, they wanted to pick something classic for each one. R.A. Fisher's studies of uh, effective population size, so they looked at mathematical modeling. Um, they looked at Thomas Park's um, original studies of competition among populations of flower beetles, tribolium. And they look at David Lack's, um, again, classic work on adaptive radiation in Darwin's finches. And they explain how each of these have their own domain that's not overlapping with the others. But I looked at that and thought, well, hold on. It actually seems to me, as a biologist, that those distinctions are really not clear at all. And, and I'll just use one example here. So let's take the tribolium. So they said that's an example of a lab study. We are working in the lab. We have the advantages of it being controllable, but it's not as unconstrained as in the field. Well, so what actually is the natural habitat of tribolium? I'm sure all of you know it's a stored product pest. It's been a stored product pest for thousands and thousands of years, which has given many, many thousands of generations. Um, it's been commensal with humans. And sure, you know, you can keep them in the lab. So, so this is just showing you. So this was a classic work looking at competition among populations and how population numbers um, were different between two different tribolium species. Um, but, you know, and certainly the investigator can manipulate, you know, how much food they have, um, what temperature it is in the incubator, and so forth. But those things also vary in quote unquote the field. I mean, why isn't this the field for tribolium? Is this the lab? It doesn't really seem like the lab, but it must be the field. But then if it's the field, it shouldn't be the lab. And so, I think that a lot of these things really, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, obviously I'm picking on this one example, but honestly I think you could do the same thing with both of the other examples that Winther et al. have in their paper. And I think that the real point is that the blurring of the mind, the lab, and the field is really what happens in science. And that has a lot of very important implications for how we think about the generalizability of the work that we do. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now moving from models as in mathematical models and now talk a little bit more about so-called model systems. As we're all really familiar with, lab mice are the quintessential model system. We use them in biomedicine for everything. Um, we think of them as representing the way humans work. Well. Mice are actually also animals, and they have a real life in nature. And so that can lead you to ask which one of them is actually a replica and of what? 
And Wayne Potts at the University of Utah and his colleagues have been working for a long time on regular sort of mice mice, you know, sort of mus musculus, that they rear in sort of barn-like enclosures that are at least a step, I mean this doesn't really look exactly like a barn, but it's at least a step closer to being um, the environment from which mice came than the cages in which they're often kept for biomedical research. And so he's done a number of really interesting, he and his colleagues have done a number of uh, really interesting experiments. Um, one that was published in quite a long time ago had to do with inbreeding depression and um, its effects on fitness in different environments. As I'm sure you're well aware, the dogma is that although um, uh, inbreeding is thought to be you know, bad for a lot of natural populations, when you look at it in the laboratory um, in a lot of different organisms, you actually see relatively little effect in terms of the ability of animals to leave more offspring and so forth. I mean, you do see inbreeding depression under some circumstances, but it's really not all that important, it, and it's not that important in lab mice, uh, for example. But what um, uh, Wayne uh, and uh, his colleagues did was to compare the fitness of inbred uh, mice that were produced through sib mating and outbred mice in these barn-like enclosures. And it turned out that although indeed if you, you know, look at them in the lab, it doesn't really have much of an effect on reproduction, in so-called field conditions, and I'm putting field in quotes because this isn't even all that field-like, the inbred males have a reproductive success that's up to eight times lower than outbred males. So we've been using this model system, but it's not really a model even for itself in the sense that if you put them in a different environment, they respond differently. And um, so what, they, what the researchers thought is that what was happening in the, in the so-called field is that the males uh, that were from the inbred mating seemed to have a harder time maintaining their territories. Their behavior was different. Um, and it's important to note that the eight times, um, eightfold difference between the inbred and outbred uh, individuals is probably a very conservative estimate because the females had uh, enough food and nest sites that they weren't competing for them. If they were also competing, it probably would have exacerbated the difference. But so this raises the question of whether lab mice, if, if the difference is that dramatic in their response, just depending on what essentially what kind of cage you keep them in, are they a good model system or not? Um, the other example uh, that I wanted to mention, which is work that they've done more recently, um, is, uh, has, to do with, uh, uh, has to do with diet, where um, they're talking, they uh, looked at mice that were fed just regular standard mouse chow, but 25% of the calories were replaced by high fructose corn syrup, which if it sounds like a lot, um, is actually not that much. It's the equivalent of a human um, drinking about three cans of soda a day. So, you know, I mean, people do that, right? You know, I mean, there, there are probably, maybe there are people in here who do that. I don't know. I'm not asking, just, just pointing it out. Um, so, okay, they took that diet manipulation. They transferred those individuals into a barn along with control individuals that had just had regular mouse chow. And it turned out that the mortality of the experimental females in this case, which is what they measured, was twice that of the controls. And the only difference was whether they'd gotten the high fructose corn syrup. And so this is a quote from their paper. Um, by almost every metric, they, meaning the mice, they're perfectly fine in cages. You don't see this under lab conditions. But in the semi-natural environment with competition between experimental and control animals, we see this large difference. Okay, so the point is not that inbreeding is worse than we had thought or that high fructose corn syrup should be banned. I mean, both of those may be true, but I'm not really relevant to my point here or that we should stop using lab mice as models. Um, and here's uh, just a, a poster that you can get, I guess, to put up in your lab to you know, make you feel like you're doing great by working on lab mice because it it's the CV of a lifesaver and it talks about all the Nobel Prizes that have uh, used mice as you know, um, models and you know, all the different things that we understand and so on and so forth um, about you know, using lab mice. But I think that it, it, what it does suggest is that when we think about things being representative, that being representative is a lot more context dependent than we want to believe. And just because you get a result from something that you think is an abstracted model system 
doesn't necessarily mean that those results hold true under all circumstances. So, you know, so again, I, I get, you know, going back to the philosophy of biology paper, it seems to me that the line between what we think of as a model system and what we think of as something that's happening in nature is really blurred. And so what do we make of it if models work in some environments and not in others? Now, this is not to say that we shouldn't be using model systems. We all use model systems. They're essential you know, to biology. We have to have them because otherwise we'd be constantly reinventing the wheel. Um, we, we would need to redevelop you know, mechanisms for husbandry and we, you know, would, would be able, we wouldn't really make any progress. But it's also the case that models that are chosen in one context, so they're, they're originally used to represent one idea or set of ideas in biology, end up getting kind of co-opted. And a really good example of this is Drosophila. Um, originally, of course, they were developed very deliberately by T.H. Morgan um, and colleagues uh, in the first part um, of the uh, 20th century to be used to understand genetics, you know, as, as the field was growing. But now they're a model system in all kinds of things, including medicine, um, behavior, evolutionary biology. And we've now come to realize that, in fact, there may be a problem with this. And this is from a, it's a great commentary in, uh, by Jessica Bolker in uh, Nature from a couple of years ago. Uh, the, the title is Model Organisms. There's more to life than rats and flies. And what she points out is that if you have a, this very small number of kind of classic model systems, it can have, it can constrain biomedical research because, for example, you know, she just gives one example. Let's say that you want to use rats that are not really bitey, because if you have really bitey rats, then you know, your lab assistants won't stay with you because they get bitten and it's a pain, and who wants to deal with bitey rats? So you end up selecting the ones that are more docile. Um, you're not studying docility in rats. But what happens if the docile ones also have correlated traits that make them differentially susceptible to whatever disease you're looking at, or their physiology turns out to be different in other regards. You can end up, by focusing on just a few model systems, doing this sort of canalization of what you're trying to look at. And I got interested in this in particular because of what I study, which is sexual selection in insects. And I got interested in this question of, well, so we start, we, we use Drosophila for lots of things, but are all insects like Drosophila? And then if you want to think about it in animal behavior more generally, are all mammals like red deer? Are all birds like barn swallows? Which, you know, both of which have been used for a ton of studies in sexual selection in animals. And so I was particularly interested in whether the use of a few model systems to study sexual selection in insects, which like I said is really what I, what I work on, biased our thinking about that process itself. And so together with Lee Simmons from the University of Western Australia, Mary Ella Herberstein, who's at Macquarie University, also in Australia, and uh, Paco Garcia Gonzalez, who's at uh, Doñana in uh, Spain, um, we decided to look at the potential for the use of only a few model systems and its subsequent taxonomic bias in sexual selection in insects. And so, so we, we know, of course, like I said, Drosophila has been super important in understanding ideas about sex differences, about sexual conflict. Classic work by Bateman says, okay, if male Drosophila keep mating, their reproductive success keeps increasing. If female Drosophila keep mating, their reproductive success plateaus. From that, we've developed a whole bunch of other theory that has to do with the way males and females evolve. But what if this work and this focus on a few systems has colored the way we think about sexual selection in general in a way that is kind of skewed? So what we did initially was to just survey the literature and to figure out, okay, we did a search for sexual selection in insects, and what genera are people working on? Well, guess what? Um, and so this was over, um, I think this is, uh, now it's been a while, sorry, I can't remember. The update. I think it's over two, two different 10 year periods um, from the literature. And Drosophila are used in almost a quarter of the articles that are on sexual selection in insects, which, given how diverse insects are, is pretty surprising. Um, 
In particular, Drosophila are used in studies of a topic that's become of great interest in sexual selection research in the last maybe 10 or 15 years, which is sexual conflict. Um, some of you may or may not be aware that um, an idea that's become of great interest to people is that um, as uh, females mate multiply, they may be harmed by, by uh, substances that are produced by males or by the mating process um, itself. So in Drosophila, for example, there have been toxic substances that accompany the sperm that um, reduce female longevity. Uh, there's also, um, uh, so this is the uh, uh, male genitalia from a bean beetle. Um, and uh, these uh, do actual physical harm during mating, um, as you might imagine. Um, and uh, they're much smaller than this, um, just FYI. Uh, and um, so, so this has, again, led to a lot of um, theory about sexual conflict and its role in sexual selection um, in insects and maybe in animals in general. And what we asked was, well, is that really a general pattern? And when we started thinking about it, so all of us work on insects, um, my co-authors and I, all, all, we all work on insects of different types, and we realized that, you know, if you look at how a lot of insects mate, it's very different than, for example, the way Drosophila mate. So in Drosophila, for example, um, females are ovipositing, they're laying their eggs, um, at the same place where they're mating. And so the males come and kind of harass females at the oviposition sites, and females are constrained because they can't go somewhere else to lay their eggs and then go someplace different to mate. Well, that's unlike the system that we see in lots of other insects, um, including, for instance, the crickets that I study, where males signal from a, so from a sedentary position, females come to them, they either mate or they don't, um, and then they go away, and the males really don't have a lot to do about it. Um, the females, in fact, are not constrained by males' ability to um, restrict their movements. And so what we were interested in seeing is whether the variation that we saw in insects made a difference to the kinds of studies of sexual conflict. And I just realized that I think I left that slide out. Hang on. just Yes, I did. Um, uh, but, and so we also found, for example, that in terms of sexual conflict, the vast majority of research that's been done on this topic has been done in this same handful of organisms, most notably Drosophila, although the bean beetles are also part of this. And so I think that what we're, what's happening is then that we're not seeing a very complete picture of the way the world works, and we're generalizing based on these model systems. And so it makes us then question what we mean by variation, both <clears throat> among and within species. So that if all individuals don't behave the same way, but we've gotten really used to this model system, it, it's tempting to reject the variation as being just kind of noise. And well, what we really want <clears throat> Excuse me. What we really want is the way the system really works. <clears throat> and in that sense, the model system becomes kind of prescriptive. And it's almost like you're suggesting that a model system isn't really just a model for something. It's almost like a role model. So that we're not studying the model system for its own sake. We're studying it because it represents something. But when does representative suddenly become normative? And we're using our model systems like role models. And so the last thing I want to talk about is a way in which we do this that I think has a lot of relevance to medicine and evolution and the way we think about males and females. And just starting with a really, you know, I think um, broad generalization, which is that, you know, People have used males as generic for a really long time, and we do this in lots of different ways in society. We do it in our language. Um, it turns out, and I'm not going to, you know, get into this whole thing of should we be, what pronouns should we be using, and, and that's kind of beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. But it is true that you know the language does affect our behavior. If you ask kids to draw a fireman, then they draw a man. Um, if you ask them to draw a firefighter, some of them draw a man, and some of them actually will draw a woman fighting a fire. Um, so. It clearly does affect how we think. And I think it affects how we look at biology. 
And so here's the Jerry Seinfeld part. Um, I don't know how many of you remember B-movie from a number of years ago in which Jerry Seinfeld played the part of a kind of slacker honeybee in the hive who didn't want to do the work that a honeybee is supposed to do. And he was a male. And you know, that's not that uncommon um, that the media portray pretty much all, you know, when you look at the movies or you look at people describing animals like in documentaries, they'll almost always refer to them as he. My students, when you go in the field, my students will call every single animal they see he. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it's doing. They're all he, um, every single one. Um, and I think that that's a very, you know, general phenomenon. And, you know, again, why people do that is kind of beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. But, this also has led to, I think, a change or a canalization of the way we think. I'm sure you all know that for a long time, or maybe you don't, um, people thought that um, bee colonies, honeybee colonies, were dominated by males. It took them a really long time to figure out that the individuals that you see, all the honeybees flitting from flower to flower, all the ants going back and forth to your sugar bowl, they're all females, all of them, every single one. They're all females. I mean, unless you like specialize in studying social insects, you have probably never seen a male social insect. And this took people forever to get their heads around. Um, Aristotle had trouble with it. Mostly people were having difficulty because they, fig they knew that you know, honeybees could sting. And they thought, OK, if you've got a weapon, then you must be male. But then if you've got a weapon, then they also knew that the drones existed and so uh, in a honeybee colony. So the drones are the males. Um, uh, uh, the drones are the males, but um, of course the drones um, uh, don't do any of the work, they just hang around and, until they mate and then, you know, they're done. Um, and so they were confused because they thought, okay, if the, uh, the workers with the weapons were the females, then that would mean that, or sorry, were the, were the males, then that would mean that the females just lay around and didn't do any work, and then that didn't make sense to them. And so they had, I mean, reading this literature is very amusing because you can see that people had a lot of trouble figuring out how that would work. Aristotle ended up concluding that, well, maybe honeybees just have the sex organs of both sexes in the same individual, which, you know, is not that far-fetched. I mean, it's not like it would be impossible, but wrong. Um, and so, so literally it took until the 1600s until people figured this out. And so I always get questions about army ants um, when I talk about army ants and teach animal behavior. Um, and so, you know, I talk about the big um, workers that have the gigantic jaws. Um, and they, of course, are all, um, they, of course, are all, uh, all female. And I get these uh, students that will come up to me at the end of the lecture and they'll say, so, Dr. Zook, you know about the, the army ants? And I say, yeah, I know about them. I just lectured about them. Um, and and uh, then they say, well, so, so you know the, the, the big ones with the gigantic jaws that defend the colony and can, like, kill, you know, hens and people and all kinds of stuff? And I say, yeah, I know about them. Um, and they say, so, so are they female? And I say, yep, they're all female. And they say, even the soldiers, like, the, the student, they really don't want to believe this. And I, I, and, and I always say, yep, those are all female. And then they kind of slink off and they, they sort of look at me. And I, I always feel obscurely like I failed the student in some way. I, I'm not quite sure why, because they really are all female. Um, and so, you know, again, the media keeps doing this. Um, this is another one of those social insect movies from a while ago, and it's Every Ant Has His Day. Um, and, you know, it is her day, really. Like, how hard would this be? I, I just don't really understand this. Anyway, OK. so. I can see that that's, you know, I know this is a pet peeve of mine, I, and obviously now you can tell that it's a pet peeve of mine as well. Um, but I think that there's a bigger issue here, and it has to do with the way we generalize. Um, and it comes out in the way we look at model systems. So here's a t-shirt. You can get a t-shirt with this image on it. Um, if you just look online, you can get, you know, if you can get a t-shirt that says you're Mr. Lab Rat. You can also get a t-shirt that says you're Mrs. Lab Rat. But Let's say you just want a t-shirt that says Lab Rat. Turns out Lab Rat and Mr. Lab Rat are the same thing. Mrs. Lab Rat is kind of different because she's pink. And I think that what that, I mean, I know it's just silly and it's a t-shirt and it's a, you know, an image, but I think it underscores the same difficulty that my students have, which is that they're seeing males as, in effect, the model system. They think that when you see something that's kind of the norm of what's happening, whether that's a honeybee that's going from flower to flower or, you know, what have you, that that's kind of the generic, that's the standard, that's what you would want to study if you're going to study something, and that's a male. And that means that females become kind of an afterthought, something that you only study after 
you kind of get the standard part of it down and then you'll understand sort of the variations, the alternative reproduction or the whatever. But females aren't kind of the norm. And that, I think, is why there's been this huge neglect of females as study subjects in biomedicine. And that's been true for using females as, yikes, go away. Um, that's been true for studying females in both model systems like rats and mice, as well as in humans. And so this is just one example. I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this because it's become a big push recently. So here's just an example um, from a, um, a recent uh, a survey looking at the percentage of women in cardiovascular disease clinical trials versus how many, you know, the percentage of women that die from these various ailments. Because, you know, people will sometimes say, oh, well, the reason we're studying mostly men is because this is mostly a male problem. Oh, no. Um, so for virtually all of these conditions, um, the number of trials that are done is far fewer in women, even though the number of deaths is far greater. And I really think that part of this, I mean, I don't think people are doing this deliberately. I don't think anybody said, we think it would be a crappy idea to understand how heart disease works in women. We think we want to only understand it in men. I mean, you know, people are not doing this. Instead, what's happening is that they unconsciously figure that males are the model system. And so if you're going to start looking at something, you're going to start looking at males. And this is true despite efforts that have been going on for a really long time. This is not a recent thing. In 1990, the NIH instituted um, the Office of Research on Women's Health. In 1993, there was the NIH Revitalization Act, which directed the NIH to establish guidelines to include women and minorities. It was revised in 2001. In 2014, NIH announced a requirement for grant applicants to balance the sex of the animals and the cell lines they use to study. Nonetheless, there has been a persistent sex bias. This is just one example I found recently um, where some uh, researchers looked at surgery journals for the use of either male or female subjects, and I mean, like literally in cell lines. So you can't make the excuse that, oh, but it would be easier and more tractable to handle the males versus the females. These are cell lines. Um, and they looked at, uh, so animals and cells, and overwhelmingly, this was male biased. So um, here uh, in, the, um, in the top, we're looking at the um, uh, number of manuscripts where they even stated the sex so they did, uh, they did so in a lot of the uh, animal studies, not so many in the uh, cell studies. But when they did state the sex, overwhelmingly, 80% of them are using only male subjects. And so they, this is a quote from the paper, sex bias, be it overt, inadvertent, situational, financial, or ignorant, exists in surgical biomedical research. So, and it seems, so how is this relevant to evolutionary medicine? We know that selection acts differently on the sexes. And so what that means is that if we're going to take an evolutionary consideration of health and disease, we have to understand how that differential selection works. And we can't just take a model system as assuming that it's representative of both sexes. And I think, I, I, I really do wonder if maybe this, ver this assumption about, oh, we, all, we already know what we need to know because we've had this narrow approach to the use of these models. Maybe that's part of why it's been hard for evolutionary biology to gain traction in, this bi in biomedicine, because variation and the way that selection differs in different areas is part of what evolutionary biology is all about. Okay, so finally, um, hopefully I've shown you why models and model systems are important. And I think it's worth thinking about the ways in which they tell us what's normal and natural. And I'm not, again, I'm not trying to suggest we don't use them. Because I think they show us things that are possible. But they caution us, or at least they should, about overgeneralizing. Oh, and this last point is uh, something that this is for, for, for any philosophers, that um, there's this constant thing about, you know, oh, you know, do we or don't we have to tell, we don't need to test models against reality. Um, and then periodically in the philosophy of science thing, we start talking about, well, actually, what is reality? So whatever that is, it doesn't matter. Um, we don't have to test them against it. Um, uh, and so the final point is just to make some acknowledgments. So this is Mike um, uh, Travisano, who, like I said, is sort of a co-author in um, a lot of this work. And then the rest of these people um, gave a lot of helpful comments. Um, 
I'm supported by NSF and University of Minnesota, and I'm really grateful to the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science for fostering me to think about some of these things. And now thanks to all of you. So um, thanks for a great talk. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion about that. We, we talk about models which are very different things, right? We use the same word for things. So I'm studying an ant in one population in California, and it's my model, right? So I think what, what generally model organisms are is just more people working on the same thing. Would you subscribe to that? or? But I think that's not the sense in which we try to, to sell it to NSF, for example. So I think people are trying to sell it as you can say it's your model, but you could just as easily in that sense say, oh, but this is the subject that I study. I think what, what we're all taught to, to sell is this idea that by studying this ant, I'm going to be able to understand something more than just you know this one species. I'm going to be able to understand Ants in general, I'm going to be able to understand social insects, I'm going to be able to understand insects. I mean, where do you want to set this? And I mean, we are trying to generalize. I mean, everybody's trying to generalize. Nobody's trying to say, oh, I just want to understand, you know. So, so I think that's where some of the, the blurring comes in. So you, in the beginning, you used the metaphor of recreating the wheel, right? That's why we use these models, so you don't have to recreate the wheel. However, it looks like we might need to recreate the wheel, or are, do you see any kind of shortcuts where you can calibrate specific organisms to the models? I mean, how do we move forward so we don't have to spend so much time building Right, a lot so, of data? so two things. So one of them is, remember, I think proof of concept models are not trying to recreate the world. I think they are a world unto themselves. And that's really different than saying it's a, it's a simplified replica. And I just think we need to be cognizant of that and stop giving people who are doing modeling work a hard time for not testing their models. So, that, so I think that, that was the point I was trying to make with that. The not reinventing the wheel, yeah, of course. I mean, no one wants to sit there and say, okay, now I've reared this, you know, I, we can rear like millions of Drosophila in almost no time at all. Um, and no one would ever want to give up on that kind of utility. But there has to be a way of recognizing the limitations of the generalizations you can make without giving up all of that utility. I mean, again, for biomedical research, can you imagine the IACUC nightmare you would have if, you know, you said, oh, no, I don't want to use this mouse. I want to use a different kind of mouse. You know, now I want to use this. Now I want to use that. Um, so, you know, no, I mean, th there's a, obviously a practical aspect to this. I just think there have been some inadvertent consequences that we haven't necessarily realized. So, so uh, Marlene, that um, fantastic, thoughtful talk, and I really appreciate someone of your credibility telling people that Models don't always have to be tested. That's not always the point. Um, a question, how much of this do you think is sort of specific to the nature of doing biology? What if I were to, you know, to what degree do we, uh, we could we have a parallel, or, or would, we, would we need to have a parallel discussion in, say, physics and then aspects of the social sciences? Oh, each? that's, so what an interesting question. I have not, I, I've, I've not thought about that, um, but what an interesting question. Do you think people, I, yeah, I've never thought about it. So, so if you're doing, there's certainly been a lot of pushback in social sciences about, you know, we don't want to do all of these studies of undergraduates in psychology classes and have them be representative of the way people are. And so I think in that sense, people are recognizing, oh, you're not really getting a represent, representative of the world. But I, I, I'm, with the physical sciences, what a great question. I've never thought about it. What, I mean, what do you think? Do, do people in physics, I mean, people in physics use models all the time, but, you know. They use models all the time, but it does seem to, they use, seem to use them differently. Yeah. And the strategy of, um, this sort of model system strategy doesn't seem to be something that's important there. And then in the social sciences, right, I've never heard anybody sort of brag in their application, yeah, we're using, uh, you know, state university undergraduates as a model system. Um, they always try to excuse that rather than bragging about it. Um, and you know, I, I don't have answers either. I mean, yeah. just. So I wonder if that. I wonder if that's true. I wonder if you know. 
Because cer well, certainly the males as model systems issue has been a big deal in psychology and sociology, and some of the research that I started, some of what got me started thinking about that had to do with generalizations about um, about this. There's a, a famous study. Some of the the um, some of the details have been criticized, and, and you know it, it, that part doesn't really matter. But there's a, a study from the 70s that gave a bunch of people a survey that um, uh, they were clinicians, you know, psychology clinicians, like you know, counselors and and uh, so forth, um, asking them to characterize using these you know terms to characterize a healthy, um, uh, well-adjusted um, adult uh, woman, a healthy, adjusted, you know, well-adjusted uh, man, or just or they were just asked to a healthy, adjusted person. Um, and uh, the answers for, it was sort of like my lab rat diagram in that the answers for what characteristics would you use to describe someone who's a healthy, well-adjusted man were exactly the same as the characteristics you'd use to explain a healthy, well-adjusted person, but the ones for women were different. And so that, you know, which I find really interesting, and the suggestion, again, is that, well, okay, so then, if you're a healthy woman, you can't also be a healthy person, which is kind of weird. I have a, a question about um, whether you think essentialism is playing some role here. Uh, when you're you know, giving your talk, I was thinking about how well, really the question is, you know, how is this model um, going to potentially be useful for having an effect on health, right, if we're talking about biomedical research, and if we, you know, think, well, there is some model system that is the description of the world right. yep. versus there's some model system that'll help us make progress, um, that those are very different ways of thinking of what a model is. Yep, no, absolutely, and I, so I think there's a difference, I mean, to, to use more jargon, there's a difference between being essentialist and being normative, and so, and I think that's what I'm kind of trying to get at here. So there's a, there's a difference between saying, oh, this will actually end up with good implications for what we want to try and do in medicine versus this is normal and everything else is not normal. And I think the former is okay and the latter gets us into trouble. So as I was walking through, so I, I, I teach modeling and, and I give a very, very similar lecture and I always start with the George Box quote about, you know, um, you know all models oh, are wrong. Yeah. But some are useful. My, so, so my it's really funny because my students love that quote, and Mike, uh, my co-author, just rolls his eyes because he 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 thinks it's well. Anyway, go go ahead. Yes, my students love that quote, though. Well, I mean, I guess the thing is, so George Box is dead, right? And um, so, uh, and we keep giving this lecture. Yes. Is there something essential about the way we think that's going to? I mean, can we really make progress here? Yeah. Or are we just stuck what a great question. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So I think we can, and I think so. Part of it for me was this recognition that there was this. So so I I, I think the part of the recognition for me was this rec, was this idea that models are not just when you come up with a mathematical equation to describe a given phenomenon, the same idea is true when you say, I'm only going to use male rats to understand cardiovascular disease. It's all part of the same way of thinking. And I think if we can stop this, OK, there's the theory, there's the lab, there's the field. I, I think that's where we're going to start making progress. But you're right, you know, people, and then there's the whole precision, you know, generality and realism, you know, the what was that, Levins? I can't remember. Yeah, the, the little triangle thing, you know. So, so yeah, you're right. I mean, we have been saying this stuff for a long time. But, but, I, but for me, that was the recognition, is that there's actually a line to be drawn, not just in the, oh, you're just doing theory. So, so do you get asked the whole, like, are you going to test your theory? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, but I mean, and, and, and I also, you know, the students, I mean, I show them a picture of a Roman model. Yeah. A picture of a computer and a picture of a lab rat. Right. And these are all the same. Right. And students say, no, they're not. We, you know, a, a model on a runway, that's, that's a totally different term. Right. You know, but, but they don't have definitions really that distinguish them. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Our time is up. Thank you so much, Marlene. Thank you.